All right, welcome to this episode, and today I'm super, super excited to talk about how do we think critically in the golden age of content? How do we think critically in the age where, you know, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in the world, where um, there's always information coming our way? How do we distinguish nonsense from truth? How do we distinguish useless content from principles? Or how do we exactly reason with um, internet content that are coming our way? And how, do, how exactly do we gain a deeper understanding of the topics that we're interested in? Um, without falling into the traps of misreading or in philosophies, it's, it's especially important. So how do we exactly deal with, you know, popular content without losing a grip on, um, on reason, without really losing a grip on our realities? Or how do we exactly um, be intelligent about dealing with um, information that's coming at us? Because um, a part of my work that I really want to do with my work, a part of this um, goal of mine is to offer sort of like video essays on how do we deal with the world um, as a young adult. But my perspective is kind of like this philosophical perspective. Of course, you can watch other people um, with other perspectives, but I like to apply philosophy to real life uh, because I'm a very passionate student of philosophy and I like to apply what I've learned to everyday situations. So that's a bulk of the work that we're doing here. So before we start today's entire exploration and um, Mind you, this is going to be a bit of a longer one. But before we start start that entire exploration into the nature of speech versus writing, into the nature of um, sort of like how do we overcome this obsession that we have with certainty and how do we exactly deal intelligently with information, I want to give major credit to Peter Salmon, who was, um, in fact, a Melbourneian writer. Um, he wrote this brilliant book called um, An Event, perhaps, which is a biography of Jacques Derrida. And... Derrida's work, in a sense, is probably uh, impenetrable to a general reading public. But Peter Salmon's book provided a brilliant introduction into some of the works of Derrida. And most of these insights, I'll be drawing, drawing a lot of insights from him. And I'm actually a part of his winter course. Uh, he's actually lecturing a course at the Melbourne School of Continental Philosophy, which um, I'm lucky to be, to be a part of. And his lectures are just some of the most engaging lectures ever. And I've certainly, it's certain, certainly illuminated a lot of my understanding of Derrida. So the story all began uh, with Plato. So Plato and Socrates, if you are into philosophy, what's going to happen is that you would have realized that Socrates had never written a word in his life. Socrates never trusted, really trusted a written form. And all of the books by Plato, they were written in what's called a Socratic dialogue, the form called the Socratic dialogue. And this is already going to draw some sort of like, this is already going to provide some answers to this debate between speech and writing. And in the book Phaedrus, uh, Plato basically wrote down this conversation between Phaedrus and, um, and, Pla and, and Socrates. So Socrates went up to this Athenian aristocrat and he basically started asking him questions like, you know, what do you think of this form called writing? What do you think of writing compared to speaking? You know, if I write something to you, does it convey more truth? compared to if I just speak it to you right now, you know? So they had one of these little debates and Socrates basically uh, told the story or the Egyptian myth of the king Thamus and his interaction with uh, the, the god of writing, uh, Thuith. So one day Thuith paid a visit to King Thamus and he said to King Thamus, hey, look, I got this gift of writing that I want to give to you to give to the Egyptian people. You know, it is this thing that's going to make people wiser because you can use this writing thing to, you know, write concepts down, to write down scientific theories. You can sort of like uh, make people wiser. You can give this piece of writing to everybody and then you can let everybody decide what they want to do with this piece of theory. And you can sort of like, um, you can distribute knowledge quicker, right? It's going to make people wiser because writing is dis distributing knowledge quicker and it's able to do things that speaking cannot. It's more complex than thinking. I mean, it's more complex than speaking. Uh, you know, it's a little more uh, nuanced than speaking, and you can use it to make Egyptians wiser. So King Thamus sat there, scratched his beard, and, you know, thought about it. But then he shook his head, and then he looked at Thuith. Thuith is like, you know, what's wrong with writing? And then King Thamus basically argued that writing is actually making Egyptians stupider. It's actually making them stupid. Because by the act of writing things down, they no longer have to remember anything. They no longer have to exercise their faculties on the spot. They no longer have to sort of reason on their feet, right? They no longer have to just like say something um, 
to someone's face to confront a person. Instead, they can just write them a note, right? And that's, in a sense, Thamus's argument or King Thamus's argument uh, against writing. Because um, according to um, Peter Salmon, writing without a father, so you know, writing in a sense without the presence of the writer or without that you know, physical presence of the person who's del delivering the message, um, cannot defend itself. So for example, if I want, um, for example, if I, if I want my sister to pick something up from the store for me after um, uh, when, when she's on her way back home, I'm just kind of like, you know, there are two ways to go about it. I could either write her a list and send it to her, or I could you know, call her and, you know, tell her to get the thing for me. If I write the list for her, this list is, is in a sense, once I've written it down, it's outside of my control. Her interpretation of this list is going to be, you know, it's going to be different from my original intention. It's going to escape my original meaning. It's going to be without a father. For example, um, you know, this is a this is a really good example provided by Rick Roderick, I think, and he's the lecturer on Derrida. So he basically said, if I write my wife a shopping list and um, and I leave that shopping list on the, on the desk, and if I get run over by a bus uh, the very next second, flat like a, like a tortilla, then my wife can still make sense of that list. But then without the presence of the writer, that list is prone to a lot of misinterpretations or uh, misreadings, right? And that list is basically prone to all sorts of weird sort of like um, misreadings. She could pick up the wrong thing from the store and could pick up the wrong quantities and could pick up the wrong sort of like color of the thing or could pick up the wrong type of apple, for example. So writing always had this sort of um, misinterpretation element to it, whereas speaking Speaking has a lot, you know, the, the margin for misinterpretation of speech is a lot smaller. So speaking is not, you're not that prone to mis, mishearing someone, right? You're not that prone to um, misunderstanding someone if you're saying something to their face. And of course, um, this sort of paranoia against writing, this paranoia for writing, uh, it basically ran through the course of um, thousands of years of Western, Western philosophy. Uh, Aristotle later on, coined writing as um, something that's defective. It's merely a symbol for speaking. And the French Enlightenment philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau uh, went as far as to call writing a dangerous supplement to speaking, right? It's a, it's a very dangerous thing because you can do all sorts of crazy, crazy stuff with it. So it's unnatural. Writing is unnatural. It's a sinful creation. Now, I want to bring this debate between writing and, um, and speaking back to this idea of how do we deal with information critically in a modern age. You know, apparently, uh, Robin, you just went on a philosophical rant. You know, you're lost in the clouds, you know. What does this writing and um, speaking debate has to, do with, um, has to do with anything that we're talking about here? How do we think about information intelligently in a modern age? How do we deal with Instagram, YouTube, TikTok? How do we deal with all this content that are, that are like coming our way? Like sort of like taking up our mind space. How do we deal with that? I want you to notice that as you go on YouTube or Instagram or Twitter or uh, TikTok or, um, or even Facebook, if you still use Facebook, that the predominant medium, the predominant way of interacting with information is predominantly through speaking or speech. Even in a written domain, online blog posts are in a sense written in a way that's supposed to resemble a conversation, you know, it's in a conversational tone. And, you know, if we bring an example down to YouTube or, you know, Instagram reels, you know, whenever someone's telling you something on Instagram or YouTube, you know, that's just blatantly, um, that's just blatantly obvious. It's a communication through speech. It's no longer through writing. Captions are merely supplements to, um, to speaking. So in a sense, Rousseau was correct. It's a, it's a supplement that's no longer dangerous. Uh, whereas your whole attention when you're spending time on the internet, when you're listening to a podcast or when you're listening to uh, my YouTube video or when you're listening to someone on TikTok or Instagram, you are relying on speech. You're relying on this act of communication through speech. You're relying on the speaker telling you exactly what the speaker's, um, speaker's, um, speaker's intention is. You're relying that gap of communication where that gap of interpretation is a lot smaller, right? So when I say something, you can just understand me straight away. And when someone else tells you something on the internet through Instagram or something, you can just understand them straight away. That margin of interpretation is, is a lot um, is a lot smaller. There's less room for misinterpretation. So hence, you know, that brings us the problem of just taking influencers 
uh, at face value or taking ideas from the internet at face value. Because when I was younger, um, I started using a computer quite late. So before when I try to figure out how to uh, how, how a certain thing works or how a certain subject is supposed to be. I remember that I had a had an obsession with um with the structure of guns. So that that was my obsession when, when I was a kid. I was really into airsoft and I wanted to know how to how to do specific things with it, with my airsoft like airsoft rifles. And I had to go to the library and find a book on airsofts and had to you know follow the instructions to really to really figure out how the thing works, right? So I had to drag my mom to the library, had to borrow her library card, had to read through all of these entries, and then finally I know I know how to how to do this thing. But whereas nowadays my my immediate impulse is to look up uh, a YouTube video on a subject, or for example, I'm thinking about some philosophy idea. My immediate impulse is to consult Philosophy Tube or the School of Life or you know something on the internet or a short article, a short introduction to a thinker. You know that's my immediate impulse. And that's an impulse that I have to resist um, as I get deeper and deeper and deeper into, into my reading, right? So I want you to notice that your immediate impulse is to consult speech as a form of communication from the internet instead of reading something about it. Instead of consulting a source of information that's in a sense denser, your first instinct is to watch a short YouTube video on it, is to read a short blog post on it, is to um, go to a forum and discuss it. But realize that entire exercise, right? That entire exercise is still an exercise of speech because the content on the internet, they're in a sense boiled down to a very conversational level. And then you're merely relying on these hearsays to construct how you should think about the world. So you're cut off from that medium of critical thinking straight away because you're just taking people on that face value, right? You're taking influencers on that face value. And I talked about this concept of um, personality over content in my previous previous video essay, you know, the dangers of romanticizing the liberal arts, where I talked about that there's more of a focus on the personality of the person um, compared to the actual content the person's bringing. And you can have non-experts telling you something on the internet and they actually don't know anything about the subject. And um, that's going to feed your brain with a lot of uh, misinterpretation of the ideas or misreadings uh, of certain philosophers or misreadings of history or you know, yada, yada, yada. There's a lot of, there's a huge margin for um, bad information on the internet because it's so democratized and it's sometimes hard to figure out who to listen to or who not to listen to. But if you're first seduced by the charm of the presenter, it's going to be really hard for you to break out of that speech as truth, right? It's going to be really tricky right there. So how do we resolve this problem with taking people out just at face value or taking people um, just based on their words. So in the summer of 1965, the French philosopher Jacques Derrida was on a cruise trip to Vienna, uh, actually uh, to, to Venice, not Vienna, and with his family on a holiday. And he, in a sense, he was sitting on the steamship. He was sitting there and he was thinking about some of the stuff that he published. He was thinking about, thinking about his academic work. And then all of a sudden, an insight hit him. A grand insight hit him and he turned to his wife Margaret and he basically said to her you know I think something just happened to me and of course something did happen to him and what came out the other end was a gloriously bonkers book you know that's Peter Salmon's phrase a gloriously bonkers book called of grammatology so of grammatology I actually personally wouldn't recommend you to read this book uh, I had to read excerpts of this book for this winter course but then this is a book that discussed everything from linguistics to phenomenology to uh, to like um, you know the, to, to the Chinese alphabet um, to spelling systems of ancient civilizations uh, to ideograms and I shit you not there was actually an entire chapter dedicated to masturbation and this is just like this gloriously messy book um, that tackled so many subjects there's so much stuff in there and um, and it's just like uh just a just a crazy book. If you want to read it for entertainment value, I would recommend you to read it. It's a very fun book to read. Um, the excerpts are really fun to read, and at some point, at some point, I'm probably actually going to pick up the book and read it um, in its entirety. But right now, um, even the excerpts are just completely bonkers to read. And besides all of this crazy stuff, the key thing that Derrida was trying to one of the key things in the book that Derrida was trying to address was this distinction between writing 
and speaking, right? So writing and speaking, he was trying to resolve that dichotomy. So if philosophers for thousands of years, they were concerned with this act of speaking as communication of truth, then Derrida basically noticed that, um, that this idea of truth or fixing a truth or trying to get an objective meaning of what the speaker's talking about, this is actually um, sort of like fixing something, right? This is actually putting a, a solid meaning to something. Uh, this is actually putting like a, a fixed state to an object or a fixed definition of a thing. But he basically realized throughout his you know, rigorous philosophical thinking, I'm just providing it with, with a very, very general overview. This is a gross simplification of um, Derrida's deconstructive methods, but let's just run with it for the sake of argument. But Derrida basically noticed that if you try to fix anything, uh, for example, I give you a statement or I give you a definition of a thing, or if you try to fix the meaning from the sounds that are coming out of my mouth, then we are necessarily excluding other interpretations through this process of fixing, right? And Derrida basically argued that this di distinction between speaking and writing is obsolete because um, even with speech, when you try to fix a meaning, there are still all of these excluded meanings that are within this um, item of speaking that you're trying to fix a meaning onto, right? And in writing is just, you know, so much more, so much more obvious. It's just blatantly clear in writing that you can fix a reading of a very elaborate piece of literature, but that act of fixing <clears throat> is in a sense an act of violence. You're excluding all the other possibilities. And a really beautiful analogy is uh, as a taxidermist, if you want to capture a butterfly, and if you want to pin this butterfly to the board, then if you pin the butterfly down, yeah, sure, you're going to have a st uh, stable structure of a butterfly. You're going to have this beautiful butterfly in, the, in a casket or in your frame. But what's going to happen is that you're excluding all the movements of, of this butterf butterfly. You're excluding all the natural cycles, the butterfly, um, the mating cycles, how the butterfly acts in its um, natural habitat. You're excluding all of that in favor of a stable pinned down butterfly, right? The butterfly is dead. So you're excluding all the possibilities, all the life, all the force of this butterfly, but you're just pinning it down to a very stable concept. And Derrida took it a, took it a step further and sort of like applied this fixing analogy to the rest of philosophy. And he basically said that when philosophers are trying to define a thing, for example, there's a, there's a cup or there's a mug on, on this table right here. If I want to say what the mug is, by saying that this mug is X or this mug is held down by gravity or this mug is gray or this mug is something, 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 I'm necessarily making a statement about it. I'm in a sense pinning this, this, this cup or pinning this mug like I pin a butterfly. So I'm excluding all of these um, variations of interpretations of this definition, right? I'm necessarily exclu excluding a lot of possi possibilities. And Derrida basically equated that entire thing as, um, as an act of violence, as an act of us trying to get a stable meaning whilst excluding the ambiguities of life, excluding all the, um, all the crazy stuff that could happen. So he bas he's basically arguing like a stable form of viewing the world, a stable concept that we can use to view reality with, every concept is limited because life is a lot more complicated than any piece of concept. And once we embrace that idea that once we fix a thing, there's like other things going on around this thing that we fixed, then we enter a state of what Derrida coined as difference. So difference is a state of deference. You're deferring the meaning till later. You're deferring this meaning till um, you're not trying to define a thing, but you're just trying to let it go. You're trying to let it do its thing. You're trying to give it its organic expressions. You're trying to let the thing unfold. Now, difference is going to directly give rise to this thing of what the Greeks coined as aporia. So aporia is a state of confusion, and it's a state of like, um, it's basically a state when you're confused about something. Aporia is just doubt of your own uh, old logic, right? So aporia could happen if you're in a situation that you've never experienced before. Aporia, aporia could happen in many different situations. And if you're encountering something new, aporia could happen. And um, if, you're, if you're dealing with something, a difficult concept in mathematics, or if you're dealing with um, brand new theories, when you're learning, aporia is always going to grab you by the balls, right? So in a sense, the journey of learning 
trying to tie the entire video back together to the original point here. The journey of encountering information and learning, they must by necessity, you have to encounter the state of aporia because reality itself is a lot more complicated than any theory that you can prescribe to it. Uh, reality itself is a lot bigger than your frame of view of this reality. And once you have new information coming in, that's going to throw off your throw off your worldview. And that's in a sense a good thing. And our impulse when we're confused is to run on the internet to find an answer. Whereas, you know, um, uh, whereas, you know, according to Derrida, you're supposed to embrace that confusion. You're supposed to embrace that state of aporia. You're supposed to open yourself up to a state of maybe I don't know. Maybe I need to think about it a little harder. Maybe I need to read more books on the thing. Or maybe I should watch a few videos and compare the perspectives of these videos. And once you enter the state of not knowing about a thing, that's when you're actually the most open minded. That's actually when you're able to deal with information head on. That's when you're able to enter a true state of like um, difference. You can defer a certain meaning till later. So you can open yourself up. You can open up all the space in your brain to explore, to explore like alternative mediums, to explore different perspectives, to get a, get contradicting views and somehow resolving those contradictions to become very comfortable with paradoxes. Right? So that's the, that's the power of deferring a certain definition till later. We're not saying that you're never going to arrive at a certain definition. You know, human beings need certain definition to definitions to survive. We need to know when we should act. You know, survival is very important. But always when you're dealing with a new concept, embrace that confusion. Embrace that state of like, you know, new information's coming in and, and, and I don't really know what to do with it. Should I act like this or should I act like that? Or, you know, should I listen to this intellectual or that intellectual? Should I listen to uh, Jordan Peterson or should I listen to Shlafoy Zizek? You know, all this kind of stuff. Um, you know, just try your best to not know for a little bit. Put yourself in a state of like deferring a meaning till later. Because once you fix a meaning, you know, you're fixed there forever. You're, you're left with a dead butterfly, right? But if you open yourself up to the uncertainty, this open-mindedness or this sort of um, state of not knowing, then you allow more information to come in. You allow higher quality information to come in. So you're not just consulting YouTube videos to complete your understanding of a thing because you can't wait to, to, to know a thing. So you're not just reading a summary of a philosophy book just to, you know, now I know what Derrida is about, you know. So you're not just reading some simplified explanation of a thing, but you're able to open your brain up. You're able to defer meaning. You're able to sort of like open yourself up to allow an organic synthesis of understanding. And that's really what I want for you, the insight that I want you to take out of this video. And it is a longer video because uh, we covered a lot of ground and um, and I hope you guys have um, gained a lot of value from this one. And I hope you will check out uh, the recommended readings of um, on a companion article. And I certainly linked a lot of resources to this one. And if you wanna check out the podcast episode in, in the description, it's also available. And at last, if you want to support my work, I have a link to buy me a coffee where you can support this channel through getting me a coffee, fueling my caffeine addiction, so I can spend more time um, scripting these videos, recording these videos for you guys. And nevertheless, this is the episode, or should I say, um, Critical Thinking 101 uh, on this channel. And I hope you guys had enjoyed this episode. And remember, only through embracing confusion or embracing a state of not knowing, can you allow the space for you to achieve a, a deeper understanding of subjects? And R.C. Walden here. Uh, stay curious, keep thinking, and I'll see you in the next one.